right, are there any questions about anything that we have covered so far in the class or anything else about the class? I'm seeing some no's, no's, no's. Okay, then this is where we are. Uh, we're working on the health and stress section and then we will move on to personality today. We'll finish health and stress and move on to personality today. The only thing that's due in personality is a quiz, so just make sure that you have a score of some kind before, the, before Saturday. Take that quiz for personality at some, at some point uh, this weekend and make sure you have a score for it. That's all you have to do for this weekend uh, along with test number five. You have to get test number five done as well. For this unit, stress, health, and well-being, we just finished talking about the general adaptation syndrome that occurs during a chronic stressor and the fact that we can just be so overwhelmed that one more thing will break us. That's the resistance phase issue. And then after a long period of time in a chronic uh, general adaptation syndrome, we just wear out completely. And even with nothing else coming along, we can die because we don't have our ability to fight the uh, cuts, colds, common colds, viruses, bacteria, because our immune system has been compromised. So psychoneuroimmunology is a new field that studies the influence of our mental states on the immune system. And we know that a person with, uh, with a optimistic attitude can um, survive stress a little bit better and their immune system is better. And a person with a pessimistic op attitude, they have a lower immune system. Stress itself will lower our immune system as well. So the mental states and our immune system are important to know. And immunosuppression is the diminished effectiveness of the immune system caused by the impairment or suppression of the immune response in our bodies. We also have learned that the suppression is under our control. We can be uh, classically conditioned to turn off our immune system. We saw that in the, one of the rat experiments. And our immune system then means it's under our control. We do have some control over our immune system. Our psychological responses under stress depend on personality, which we'll talk about in the next chapter, our perceptions of our experience and the ways that we've learned to respond, as we saw in the primary appraisal review. And psychosomatic illnesses are stress-induced body pains. Ow, my hand hurts. But I didn't, there's no reason for it to hurt. So why is it hurting? I had a my, an occipital migraine does not hurt at all there's no pain associated with an occipital migraine it's caused by stress and i completely lost my sight i was blind except for visions of um, shapes and colors black and white mostly but some colors all over my visual field i could not see what was in front of me during that process and it was all based on stress, completely stress, psychosomatic illness. Eustress, we've already talked about, is good stress. Uh, we need a little bit of stress to keep our bodies charged up and ready for to meet new situations in our life. And there's a mind-body connection where this refers to how our thoughts, beliefs, and emotions can produce physical changes that can be beneficial to us or detrimental to us for stress is detrimental to us, but if you will sit and meditate or get hypnosis, then that is beneficial to you. Your immune system comes back online. So mind-body therapy is a therapy based on findings that thoughts and emotions can change physical responses and can change the immune system. Our mind-body therapy uses mental strategies such as relaxation, meditation, biofeedback, which we will talk about, as well as social supports to help change negative beliefs and emotions into more positive ones. We do have a issues in the world, conflicts in our world, and conflicts will cause us stress. So conflict is a feeling we experience when we must choose between two or more incompatible 
and competing options. And there are three different types. The approach approach type is making a choice between two situations where both of them will result in positive outcomes. But you can only have one. You're working, you've applied to two different companies, the two different companies are extremely alike, very similar, and they both offer you jobs, and both the jobs are similar, pay is similar, but you can't have both of them. You've got to pick one or the other. That's an approach approach. Avoidance avoidance is choosing between two situations where both of the out outcomes will be negative outcomes. You must choose the best of two bad options. We just did that two days ago. Elections for President of the United States. So we just went through that. Um, avoidance, avoidance. Pick, your, pick the best of two bad options. So that's, um, the, it happens every four years. <laughs> and approach avoidance is when one thing that you cannot escape is going to cause you both negative and positive outcomes. Good example of that is having a child. It's going to be absolutely wonderful and absolutely horrible at the same time. <laughs> so it's approach avoidance. And that's, these are different types of conflicts in your life. All the factors that promote your health and well-being will also combat distress, bad stress, and they are largely under our controls, our social support systems, our biofeedback we'll talk about, optimistic thinking, humor and love, exercise, eating right, and drugs. So the first one is social supports. Remember, you have to, this is a fallback mechanism. You have to have your social supports in place before you get distressed. So resources that others provide to help an individual cope with stress. And it is developed prior to the induced stress. So you have your mom and dad to fall back on, hopefully. Your sisters and brothers, maybe. Your cousins, aunts, uncles. You also have your BFFs, your best friends. And you have to set them up ahead of time. You cannot, have, you cannot go out and search for a best friend while you are completely anxious. Because being anxious causes other people to be anxious, and they don't want to be around you if they don't know you. Well, maybe you're always that, like that anxious. You would drive me nuts if you're always that anxious. But people that know you, that you have set up the BFFs ahead of time, and now you're having a problem, you're having stress, and your BFFs know that you're having stress. This is not you. How can we help you? You're, you're not yourself. And they know that you're not going to cause them a whole heck of a lot of stress. Uh, just a little bit while you help them. Biofeedback is a device much like a lie detector. You, we actually have four of them at the college. If you're interested in them, Beth Hughes, one of the other psychology professors, has four of them that you can uh, use and see what it's like. But it's just a little device. Stick your finger in it, and it reads your blood pressure. It reads your uh, pulse. It reads a number of other aspects. They're not the greatest biofeedbacks, but they're pretty good. And this is a therapy technique for learning relaxation and new visceral responses to stress, involving devices that sense small physical changes and provide immediate feedback to the individual. The feedback that it gives you is a hum. If it senses that you are not stressed. If you're, not, if you're stressed, it's not going to give you that hum. So it's a game. You've got to stick your finger in there and try to get it to hum, try to get it to hum. And if you can do that, then you're learning how to relax. By getting that machine to hum, you are learning to relax until eventually you can stick your finger in it and it will just keep on humming because you are relaxed. So you learn how to relax. We don't know how to relax. Human beings stress out real easily and tense up, but we have a hard time learning to relax and biofeedback does that for us. We can learn to stop our immune systems from functioning, so we can also learn to improve them as well. Now, this biofeedback has a bad reputation because it came out in the 1960s along with the hippie, yippie, flower child drug culture movement. And so it gets associated with them, but it just is coincidence that they came out at the same time and that the fact that the hippie, yippie, flower children drug culture liked this device because they were all about just mellowing out and so they um, they use this device and and it seems to have made a connection there for 
a lot of people thinking that that's what it is, but it's, it has nothing to do with them. They just happen to like the device. It does work. It's a nice little device to get you to relax, and we need to learn to relax. We have two different coping strategies that we can use. Uh, one of them is to fix the problem, problem-focused coping, and the other one is to not be affected by it, the problem. That's emotion-focused coping. Older people are really good at controlling their emotions. So if you can control your emotions, then a problem that causes other people to be emotionally charged up does not cause you any problem at all. Therefore, it's no longer a problem for you. And older people have much better control over their emotions than younger people do, which means that this sets up for one of the reasons why we have generation gaps, the two generations not, not understanding each other. Young people go, well, we have to fix this problem. This is a problem. We've got to get it fixed. This is causing me all kinds of havoc. And the older people are going, well, just don't let it cause you havoc and you won't have any problem. It doesn't cause me any problem, so I don't see it as a problem. And that's a generation gap phenomenon. Uh, the optimistic thinking is, seems to be associated with better results in your body, your physical capability, your mental capability. Uh, it reduces stress. So optimistic thinking, some of the ways that we look at optimistic thinking, you see things as specific causes to distress rather than global ones. So you ask a girl out, and the girl says no. You can, well, okay, she doesn't want to go out with me, but somebody else will, so I'll go and ask somebody else. Or, better yet, um, oh, you, you couldn't go out this weekend. What about Wednesday? You know, can we, how about Wednesday? We'll go out Wednesday. So she can say yes or no to that, too. But the global response would be, um, you ask the girl out, she says no. Oh, my God, the world hates me. Nobody wants to go out with me. I am, I'm despised by everybody. That's a global response rather than a specific response. The, and global responses are worse for your health. Uh, relate uh, stress to external issues. It is not me that, uh, yes, I am stressed out because of this thing, but it is not because I have some mechanism in me that's worse than anybody else. Anybody that has my particular environment with this particular stressor would feel that way. So it's that outside thing that's causing it. It's not something about me that makes me wrong or uh, that makes me worse than somebody else. So relate stress to external issues, not internal states. Uh, accepts all stressors as temporary. <laughs> I had a student once that said, well, all stressors are temporary because eventually you're going to die and then it won't have any effect on you anymore. So, yeah, I guess that's a, well, one way to look at it. But uh, always look at stressors as that they're not chronic. They're even a chronic stressor somewhere down the line is going to stop. So we accept all stressors as temporary in optimistic thinking. And then developing an internal locus of control. Again, this is, very, this is related to your culture as well because in China where the government tells you lots about how, what you're going to do with your life, then you have an external locus of control. But here in the United States, it's all up to you. What you do is up to you. And so it's an internal locus of control for the individualistic societies. And then using positive reappraisal to look at things and decide what it is that really happened here and learn from the mistakes so that you don't make those mistakes again, or at least find something that's positive in what is causing you to be stressed. And like my mother says, it's the devil poking you, and if you let the devil get to you, then they're gonna ju he's just going to keep on poking you. So find the positives in the negative situation, and what did you learn from this? How can you look at it differently? And you'll go poke somebody else instead. Positive reappraisal. And numerous studies show there's a correlation between pessimistic thinking and increased stress levels and optimistic thinking and lowered stress levels, which are correlated with decreased immune responses for your, de for your increased stress, correlated with decreased immune responses and other psychosomatic symptoms. I cannot make a person who is very pessimistic into an optimist. But everybody has that rubber band that they're living in, and so if they're very, very, very pessimistic within their rubber band, 
I can try to make them at least a little bit less pessimistic and increase hopefully their immune responses and give them some more positive responses. Dr. Bascaglia, when I was a teenager, he was a big, he was big. Uh, people talked about him all the time, he was on radio shows all the time, in the news all the time. He's called the hug doctor, hug doctor, hugging someone, because he said that we need five bear hugs a day to be a fully functioning, healthy individual. And that does not mean just, you know, pat somebody on the back. It means grab the person and pick them up off their feet and hug them hard. That's a bear hug. And he says we need five of them a day in order to be a very healthy individual. And he also talked about humor and love as well and how it helps an individual to improve their conditions. And he died in 1998, but his group continues on. So all the, all the psychologists that were with him continue to do research in, this, in these areas. And I have a little link here that you can click on and it'll take you to his website where his people are still continuing his research. So, but the question is, does humor have healing effects? Can a daily dose of humor prevent some stress-related maladies? Does it really work? And so far, evaluating the evidence from research on attitudes and health, there's no scientific data to relate total health to humor. You cannot get rid of cancer by laughing. You cannot um, stop an aneurysm from exploding by laughing. Actually, it might even make it, make it explode. Uh, so that can be classified as folk wisdom. But there are pieces of data coming out from research that shows that, bent, that there are healthy benefits to humor. It reduces stress. We can put a person into a laboratory situation in research, and we know because we've asked them about it what it is that makes them laugh. And let's say it's the three stooges that makes them laugh. So we then put electrodes all over their body and register all their stress levels, and then we purposefully make them stressed. We do things to, to stress them out. And we see all the levels for stress rise up and we see that they're stressed physiologically. They are stressed. Then we show them the funniest of the Three Stooges uh, shows and their stress levels come back down again. So there's absolutely a connection between laughing, having a good time, and reducing of stress. Since stress is very negative to your physiology and your psychology, then it is important to love and laugh. It is important to love and laugh. Exercise is another um, important aspect. Remember the right amount of exercise. You can't, if you exercise too extreme, you're not going to do as good, you're going to do more damage than good. Reduces stress and hungry when, hunger when it's done properly. Improves the ability of the body's immune system to fight diseases. So exercise, the proper amount of exercise for you is important. Nutrition and diet, I've told you a number of times already, get off sugar, stay away from sugar as much as possible. It's the fructose, really, that's bad for you. And sugar, anything that has sugar as an ingredient, is sucrose, 50% sucrose, 50% fructose. And you need to stay off the fructose. And then, of course, they put sugar in. Then they have, if you look at the ingredients, high fructose corn syrup is added on top of that. And so we need to get off of that stuff. Uh, a good diet with the proper vitamins and minerals and amino acids keeps the body at peak levels. Drugs can be used. Psychologists do not prescribe drugs. Most psychologists do not prescribe drugs. We will talk a little bit later in the psychotherapy section about some psychologists who do. But psychologists normally do not prescribe drugs, and most feel that psychiatrists prescribe them way too much as the be-all and end-all of the problem. Anti-anxiety drugs, for instance, are given to people, which definitely does help their anxiety, but it also impairs their thinking and reduces the body's available immune responses. Older people who are on five different medications are actually on one medication for one issue. 
that one medication causes some si side effect. So they have to take a second medication because of the side effect that this first medication created. Then that second medication takes care of that side effect, but creates another side effect, which then they have to take a third one for that, a fourth one for the next side effect, and the fifth one for the next side effect. It's ridiculous. And it's one of the reasons why I think that medical marijuana is a good idea, because yeah, all things have negative consequences. You know, Oxycontin is not the greatest thing in the world. It does what it's supposed to do and creates other issues as well. So why not medical marijuana? Uh, it does proper and it also has problems as well. So and the illegal drugs that you take, like LSD, that has been associated with schizophrenia. And so the illegal drugs that you take, the, not the ones prescribed by doctors, but you know your friends have a particular drug and you're taking that drug because you don't feel good, and it does more harm than it does good. That's called self-medication is what that is. And that's what a lot of alcoholics are. They're self-medicators. They have an issue. They don't want to talk to a, a, a therapist. They don't want to talk about it. They can't. They've, they've talked about it and it, it hasn't helped. You know, so well, I take a drink and I feel better, so I'm gonna drink myself to the point where I don't have any problems anymore because you know I'm not even, I'm drunk. So I don't think about my problems, but then you have other problems on top of that, just like any other drug um, does. We have a group of psychologists that study the, um, how we stay healthy, how we become ill, what we do to respond when we're ill, what works, what doesn't work. There's a behavioral medicine type of field where they specialize in the link between lifestyle and disease. The way you live can affect the way that your body reacts, and so it, the way you live can affect your health. And I have one example of this that has nothing to do with psychology, but it shows you the link exists between lifestyle and disease, and that is black lung disease. If you are a coal miner, I don't care what kind of protective gear they give you, you're eventually going to get enough coal dust in your lungs that you will die earlier than you should have from black lung disease. It's just going to happen. So your lifestyle, a coal miner, usually they start when they're very young, and then they go up until they die from or can't work anymore because of black lung disease. So lifestyle and disease. Frustrations are when we don't get what we want and we get frustrated. So the awful feeling that results when our attempts to, re to achieve a specific goal is blocked. And if we have enough frustration in our life, we get burnout. Burnout is very negative, uh, physical and psychological. It refers to physically, physical exhaustion and a feeling of being overwhelmed by everything. And your actions become unrewarding. You become cynical and detached. And you have a strong sense of ineffectiveness and helplessness. We've already talked about helplessness. This is when your hedonic capacity has been completely obliterated. Your burnout. Do you all know what? hedonism is? Have you heard of the word hedonism? Do you know what it means? Yes, no? Okay, some of you have never heard of the word hedonism. Okay, well Caligula was a Roman emperor and he was the most hedonistic person in, in history as far as we know. He would not do anything, nothing, unless it made him feel good. You don't take out the trash. Why don't you take out the trash? I don't get any pleasure from taking out the trash, so why should I take out the trash? He was so bad for his country that his guards killed him. His guards killed him. He just would not do anything unless it was pleasurable. That was it. He didn't care. That's hedonism, the um, search for things that make you pleasurable, that give you pleasure. And hedonic capacity is your ability to feel pleasure. And we've already talked about what it is that makes you happy, and that might be fishing or, or boating or hunting or, for me, bowling. I love to bowl. But if I have lost my hedonic capacity, if I get burnout, I no longer have the ability to feel pleasure from bowling anymore or from anything else. 
And I don't even think about bowling. I can't even think that when we've lost our hedonic capacity, the hedonic capacity gives us our ability to feel pleasure, but also to seek out pleasure. And if you've lost the hedonic capacity, you can't even seek out pleasure. And if that happens, you're on a spiral downward into despair because there's nothing that can bring you up. There are different types of, of people, type A people, type B people. Most of us are type C people. We're not either really intense or really relaxed. But Donald Trump is extremely, he, he's a type A person. Uh, these people are very intense. They're impatient and aggressive, competitive and hostile. They work, 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 work. They always want to get something done. They're never happy just sitting around doing nothing. And they are candidates for heart attacks and ulcers and lower immune responses. But if they have a heart attack, they get out of it much better because it is important to get up and start walking and doing things again when you have a heart attack. And type B people will use the heart attack as an excuse. Oh, no, no, I had a heart attack. I can't do that. Oh, no, no, I got to stay here and relax. I had a heart attack. That makes the heart attack worse. You got to get up and start moving around. And a type A person will. They can't sit down. They cannot sit down. They've got to keep on moving, moving, moving. So like I said, most of us are somewhere in the middle. We don't call them type C's. We just say that we're not a type A or type B. The type types also come in what we call hardy people and non-hardy people. And I think Donald Trump is a very hardy person. And they come, the three aspects that define a hardy person is challenge, commitment, and control. So let's look at those. Uh, hardiness then is the three traits, challenge, commitment, and control. Challenge is that you look forward to challenges in your life. You want to do something and you want to fix things and you want to get stuff done. And that's a challenge. Everything is a challenge. And there are people who don't like challenges. Oh, no, no, I don't, I don't want, no, somebody else can do that. That's not, no, I don't want to do that. So are you challenged to find a solution or are you burdened by the challenge when challenges occur? And everybody has challenges in their lives. But are we burdened by them? Or do we look forward to when they come up so we can solve the problem, whatever it is? And then there's commitments. So make a focused commitment to engage in the activity and actively commit, or do you feel forced? The boss in a, a business might say, everybody come together, we need to talk. There is a problem. We have this issue, it's got to be solved, or this business is going under. We've got to find the solution. Who wants to take control of the committee to, to take care of this problem, and all these people raise their hands. But remember from motivation, just because somebody does something, we can't assume the motivation that they have for it. So a person raises their hands. They raise their hand because they're like, yes, I can do this. I know some people in the group, and I know how to put together the right committee, and I will get this thing done. You give me my resources that I need, and it will be, fit, it, it will be completed. We will finish this. There are other people that raise their hands, and in their heads, they're going, He's going to pick me anyway. He always does. So I might as well raise my hand and make it look like, you know, I want it. But I know he's just going to pick me anyway. That's not a commitment. That's a burden. <laughs> so you're feeling forced into this instead of actually making the active commitment to do it. Do you get that? Do you see the difference between that? The commitments? Yes, no? I'm seeing lots of yeses. Okay. All right. So, and then you have control. The control is, you know, do you have control of your life or do other people have control of your life? And, of course, this is also culturally based because if you live in China where they tell you most of the things that you have to do in your life and how you're going to do them, well, then you think that of an external control. But here in the United States, it's much more individualistic and we have control over our own lives or at least we pretend to do so. And um, that is very similar to optimistic and pessimistic thinking. Optimists are better off than pessimists when we come to stress and physical health. It turns out a hardy type A person will not get a heart attack because they're happy with the challenge. They're happy with the commitment. They make that commitment. They, want, they feel like they're in control. And so they have less stress, which, causes, which is what causes heart attacks. So a hardy type A person has less 
heart attacks than a non-hardy type A person would. We've already talked about learned helplessness in one of the other lectures. A learned pattern of passive resignation. The animal is not re responding to noxious stimuli after the organism determines that its, its behavior has no effect at all. We have, uh, for instance, a baboon, which is already a dangerous animal, but there are some baboons that personality is really dangerous. They're nasty animals, just nasty animals. And they're also a baboon, so they're dangerous on top of it. So put this nasty animal into a colander, which is a giant metal uh, ring that comes down to a very small area so they can just barely move. And they slide down into that area, and then they try to get up, but it's a metal colander. They just slide back down again. They can't jump out. It's too high for them to jump out of it. They scream. They holler. They bite at the metal. They throw their poop everywhere because that's what baboons do when they're upset. And don't ever make a baboon upset at, at, at a zoo. They will throw their poop at you. So the baboon finally just learns it can't, it can't do anything, and it just sits down. It gives up. Learned helplessness. It gives up. Now that baboon is still dangerous because baboons are dangerous, but you can now manipulate it better because it has learned helplessness and that learned helplessness in that one situation will move off into other situations as well. I've already talked about the hedonic capacity, the ability to both experience and seek out pleasure or joy. And without this capacity to seek out activities that bring you joy, you will fall into a spiral of despair. So you need to find those things that will help you laugh, to love, to have just pleasurable experiences in life. You need someone around you that can help you to get out into the world when you're in despair and get you to those places because they know you real well to the places that will help you to feel a little bit better about yourself. The Stockholm Syndrome is a psychological event that occurs when you, it's almost like the good policeman, bad policeman thing, where you're in a situation that you have no control over and your life is on the line, possibly, but you're definitely abused in some way, shape, or form, and you're able to be, your mind is able to be manipulated in this situation, the Stockholm Syndrome. So it is a reaction in which hostages specifically identify with their captors. And what happened in Stockholm, Sweden, which is where it first occurred, and this is why it's called the Stockholm Syndrome, although it happens in other places as well, a group of people were kidnapped and they were treated extremely badly, but they were finally released by the police, finally got them and, and rescued them. And then their kid, kidnappers were brought to trial. And the prosecutor asked them to come in and um, talk about how horrible it was. And they instead went to the defense attorney and said, we want to go to trial, but in defense of our kidnappers. And that's like, what? Why? That just makes no sense whatsoever. So psychologists started to study this particular phenomenon. And there's a person in the United States that has this, um, that had this happen to them, Patty Hearst. How many of you have heard of the Hearst Empire? Any of you? Yes, no? No, lots of you have never heard of Hearst. Okay. Patty Hearst's father was one of the richest men in the United States at the time. She was an older child. She was already driving, you know, on her own. And she was kidnapped by the Symbolese Liberation Army, SLA. And the SLA asked for lots of money from her father to help to finance the movement, the SLA movement and they would release Patty Hearst. And the FBI was out looking for Patty Hearst to rescue her. But not, you know, not every FBI agent. And there was an FBI agent that was on a case for a bank robbery, and he was reviewing the videotapes of this bank robbery, and he recognized the Symbolese Liberation Army, and one of the army members 
dressed in the Assembly's Liberation Army uniform, holding a machine gun, was Patty Hearst. And so now the FBI is not looking to rescue her. Now they're looking to, to capture her because she's a bank robber. And they did. They captured her and the SLA officers, and, uh, and she went to jail. But President Nixon, I believe, pardoned her because of the Stockholm Syndrome, because this was not her original idea. She did not um, go with the Assembly's Liberation Army and then fake her father out trying to get money from her father for, this, for the SLA. She was literally, she was kidnapped and brainwashed. And that's what the Stockholm Syndrome happens. That's what happens with the Stockholm Syndrome. So this also produces what's called post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress syndrome. And PTSD is uh, when your life is on the line and you lose the feeling that you're safe, your safety, then it can affect you in such a way as to uh, trigger your, your, that event when something else comes along that makes you remember it. My stepfather had PTSD from the four two tours of duty in Vietnam when he was a sniper behind enemy lines most of the time. And he could not go to fireworks shows. The exploding fireworks would just freak him out. He couldn't go to movies where there were explosions or gunshots because he'd be under the, under the chair. And uh, he did, he has overcome that, but he overcame it from talking about it. And most PT PTSDs, they don't want to talk about it. And it doesn't have to be a military person. It can be anybody who has lost that feeling of safety that we get the PTSD from. And it isn't that they just think that they're in Vietnam again. He said he can smell the dirt, feel the moisture in the air and the heat in the air. He sees the jungle. He is right back in Vietnam again when a, something in the environment triggers these memories. So it is so intense that it's like you're right there again. And PTSD uh, is, is very, very, is, PTSD exists much more now in our environment than it did in the past because uh, we have a lot more soldiers who are coming back from some of the war-torn countries where they are protecting that country. Uh, so we have a lot of PTSD in the environment now. And, it is very difficult for these people to talk about it because when they talk about it, it triggers the feeling again. But we found that the phrenic nerve is part of the problem. The phrenic nerve, which goes down the back of the neck, is extremely active in PTSD. And if we give a shot to the phrenic nerve and calm it down, we give it xylocaine, then the person can actually sit and communicate about their experiences and think about them in a much, much more um, complete way and work through their PTSD easier. This is a new therapy approach that has not been accepted by the FDA yet, but is being tested. So any questions about PTSD or the Stockholm Syndrome or any of these? No, 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 okay. So when our ego is under attack, Freud says that we experience stress because our ego is like, you shouldn't have done that, and then that causes stress. And we use very specific defense mechanisms to reduce the stress that our ego feels. Now, we're gonna talk about nine of these, um, or eight, eight of these. We're gonna talk about eight of these. There are more, but I want you to realize they are Freud, but they're not Sigmund Freud. <laughs> <laughs> They're Anna Freud, his daughter. His daughter came up with these ideas, and he put them in his theory. So you have to give Anna Freud the, um, the, the benefit of these particular ideas. Now, repression is absolutely Sigmund Freud's idea, but the rest of them came from Anna. So she was, in her own right, a very good psychiatrist for children. 
So denial is the act of refusing to accept the realities of a situation, and this can often prove unhealthy when denial is not soon replaced by acceptance, because the longer the gravity of a situation is denied or ignored, the more serious it can become. For example, if one is in denial of a disease diagnosis, you have cancer. Oh, no, no, I don't have cancer. I'm going to go get a second opinion. I don't have cancer. And this is a part of denial. You have to actually uh, state that thing you are denying. I do not have cancer. You have to state it. That's different than repression because in repression you have no idea what happened to you, so you can't state it. So it can't be denial because you don't even know you had it in the first place. So in denial, you say, no, I don't have cancer. I refuse, to get, I refuse your, your analysis. I'm going to go see another doctor. But then you don't go see another doctor. And the, the cancer gets worse and worse and worse. And they may have been able to fix it at stage one, but not at stage four. They're not going to be able to fix it. So disease is perhaps the best example for the defense mechanism because the diagnosis of disease is the most commonly denied reality, especially in cases where the disease is fatal. And in fact, uh, denial is acknowledged as the first stage in the process of death and dying. The stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, but not in that order necessarily. Remember, when you name something, you have to name them in an order, but that doesn't mean that we think they go in that order. They're just stages that you find people in when they've been told that they are dying. They're in one of those stages, and they'll move through those stages in relationship to their own personality. Projection is really bad. It's a type of denial as well. You don't see the thing in yourself. You see it in somebody else. You project your particular issue onto somebody else instead. So projection is similar to denial in that one is unwilling to accept the realities of one's own self. And in projection, the faults and shortcomings and urges of yourself, of you, which your ego is going, ah, you shouldn't do that. You can't do that. Why are you thinking that? Why are you doing that? And now you feel stressed out because of it. Well, the way to get rid of it is to see that everybody else is doing the same thing. Projection. An employee at a convenience store considers overcharging customers for items and keeping it different for himself, just pocketing it. But then he thinks better about it. But his, his ego is like, you shouldn't have even thought of that. That's horrible. Why did you even think that? So in order to fix it, he then sees all the other employees, incorrectly, uh, doing the exact same thing, actually grossly overcharging customers and pocketing the money. He sees it. It doesn't exist, but he sees it because he's projecting his fallacy, his issues on somebody else. Rationalization. Lots of mothers do this when their sons or daughters go to jail. They rationalize the problems. Uh, you come up with various explanations to justify the situation and deny your own feelings. So uh, in rationalization, one can fabricate a great deal of information as opposed to facing the reality of the situation, and this particular defense mechanism works very well as it totally rids the individual of any sense of guilt, remorse, or responsibility, and therefore it has to be avoided as it tempts the individual to hide from reality. For example, a woman is fired for missing an excessive amount of days at work while ex while without explanation, and while she's at work, poor performance on the job. She's been fired. She goes to attorney. They're all, uh, they're all jealous of me. My boss is mean. He's, the whole company is sexist and, and racist. Right? But in fact, she is an alcoholic, and she comes to work hungover or drunk, and she does poor performance, or when she doesn't wake up because she's drunk, she doesn't even make it to work. So this is one of the most likely reasons for alcoholism. Alcoholists do not accept that they are alcoholics, and so they rationalize away everything that they're doing wrong that the alcohol is causing them to do. Repression, we've already talked about. And that's the involuntary exclusion of a painful or conflicting thought, impulse, or memory from awareness. Just, it's gone. The brain, if we were to talk about the brain pathways to a memory, then we could say the brain cuts those pathways. Just, not, we're not going to allow you to remember this thing. But I like the idea of it puts the memory into a closet, closes the closet door, throws away the key. But that particular thing that you did, that your brain just can't handle that you did it, 
is in a closet and that keyhole allows it to slowly escape into your brain and change your behavior. And Freud says we need to open that door and find out what it is that's doing that and then you can consciously instead of unconsciously behave in a particular way. Reaction formation is, <laughs> men do this a lot, um, going to the opposite extreme overcompensating for unacceptable impulses. And we see this in our senators and congressmen all the time. So examples, a man violently dislikes an employee and without being aware of doing so, bends over backwards to not criticize the employee and gives him special privileges and advances instead. The ego is going, you can't do that. That's, that's wrong. You can't feel this way about this person. And so it, the reaction formation is to the exact opposite of what you are thinking you should be doing. So a person with strong antisocial impulses, an antisocial impulse is one that's against society, and so you are something that society doesn't particularly like. So let's, let's use homosexuality. A person is a homosexual, and they don't like the fact that they're homosexual. They do not like the fact. I mean, come on, you are who you are, but they can't handle it, and so they lead crusades against it. And then we find out, wait, they're homosexual. Or you lead a crusade against people who, who have extramarital affairs. And then you find out, wait, they just had an extramarital affair. <laughs> this happens a lot with our politicians and with, unfortunately, a lot of religious leaders as well. So last one is a married woman who is disturbed by feeling attracted to one of her husband's friends, treats that friend very rudely. Uh, so you turn the feeling into the exact opposite. You might think that they're great, but you treat them with hate. Right? So then <clears throat> there is regression. And this one, uh, ladies, I'm going to give you a clue here. <laughs> and uh, this is the way men act to get to you. Right? You, uh, let me use my wife and I as an example. So my wife does not like anime movies, animation, and not really into science, science fiction, but I am. I love science fiction and I love animation. And so there's a new movie coming out that is animation and sci-fi at the same time, both things that she doesn't like. And I like going out with her. I want her to go out with me. I want her to go out with me. But if I go up to her and say, honey, there's this new movie. It's a great movie. It's animation and sci-fi. I know you don't like either of those, but come on out with me. I want you to come with me. And she'd be like, nah, you go by yourself. But I want her to come out with me. So I regress. I appeal to her mother's nature. Honey, there's a great movie coming out. I'm acting like a kid in order to get her to react to me like, oh, okay, honey, I'll go out with you. I'll take you to the movies, right? Men do this all the time. Don't fall for it, women. <laughs> and you can just say, I have down here, shoot spitballs at people. I mean, guys do this a lot too. <laughs> they, go, they regress to a childish behavior. Displacement and sublimation, the last two, are very similar to each other. But displacement is a socially unacceptable behavior, while sublimation is a socially acceptable behavior. So in displacement, you direct your feelings to another target in an unacceptable manner. You kick your dog for something your boss did. You yell at your wife because you were cut off in traffic. Your wife and your dog do not deserve that. It is not, they did not do anything to you, but you're taking out your frustrations on them. That's displacement. You're displacing what you can't yell at your boss. You get fired. So you come home and you yell at your wife instead. No, no, no. There are other ways to get rid of that feeling, that anger. Right? So sublimation is doing, getting rid of the anger in a socially acceptable manner. So you direct your feelings in a socially productive or acceptable activity. I'm angry, so I'm going to write a poem about anger. You know, I'm angry, so I'm going to go to YMCA and go boxing. I can hit people when I'm boxing, or I can hit the stupid little uh, pole while I'm boxing. Right? Or I'm going to go outside. This is what I do. I, I love gardening, so I'll go outside 
and I'm going to kill all of those weeds. I'm just going to rip them out by the roots. <laughs> and there were lots of times when I was in corporate that I was pulling weeds with my boss's name on the weed. <laughs> I was killing that weed. That's totally socially acceptable. There's another way to get rid of this um, feeling as well. Love that's too much love, too much anger, too much hate, whatever it is. If you have some person that you just, you, you need to get rid of the feeling that this person has caused in you, write a letter to the person and tell them exactly how you feel in the letter. Every little four letter of words you wanted to tell them in person, you can put in the letter. Then take it outside to the concrete and burn it. Burn that letter. And you feel better. I swear it works. It works. It's a way to get rid of that frustration that they've caused you. Make sure you don't send the letter to them. <laughs> How about um, improving ourselves by just knowledge? We know what we're supposed to do, so we do what we're supposed to do. <laughs> Not very many people do this. We know we're supposed to act a specific way, but we don't act that way. So can knowledge of improper behavior reduce bad behavior? What will that person behave healthier if they know that there is behavior they're doing that actually produces stress and, and issues, physical issues? And specifically, can knowledge of at-risk heart behaviors reduce the negative cardiovascular related behaviors? If you know you're not supposed to smoke, will you stop smoking? No, <laughs> you won't because <laughs> you're addicted to the nicotine. But my father used to say, you know, I, 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 please, Dad, stop smoking. I stopped smoking. I stopped smoking in between every cigarette. <laughs> Dad, just get rid of the smokes. So this is an actual experiment that was done in California. This is the data. I'm going to show you the data for this particular experiment that was done in California. So Town B was exposed to a mass media campaign to improve their knowledge of at-risk behaviors for heart disease. What is it that causes heart disease? Town A was the control group. Nothing was done to Town A. But in Town B, they had radio programs. They had their, they had articles in their newspaper, their local newspaper. They had magazines that were delivered to that area, had inserts in them about the at-risk behaviors. And they had been given a survey to find out how much they knew about at-risk behaviors beforehand. And now for two years, they had this mass media campaign and they kept track of how much do these people know every single year about, about at-risk behaviors. Do they improve their knowledge of at-risk behaviors? And this particular experiment, and the data I'm going to show you, proves why we need the control group. It shows you why we need a control group. So after two years, knowledge of cardiovascular disease risk factors did increase in town B, and they were more than they were in town A. But did that greater knowledge produce the desired effect and could any reduction in behavior actually be caused by something else instead? So here's the data of town A and B. Town B showed much greater knowledge of at-risk behaviors. Why did town A, however, change? Nothing was done to town A. But look at town A. And in years one and two, they had improved their knowledge. Now, not in anywhere near what Town B did, but they improved their knowledge. And then in and year three, oh my gosh, year three, they just left it. They ended the mass media campaign in year two, came back at year three and measured again how much these people knew. Look, and, they're, and they went up. They didn't do anything, and it went up. But notice the amount that it went up is about the same as the amount that went up here, too. And it turned out that the federal government was doing a mass media campaign itself on the effects 
of certain disease behaviors that cause disease. And so town, that's the reason we need a control group. There is a confounding variable you did not consider. The, the national media is doing some work also in the same area that you're doing the work in this particular case. But town A and town B were not the only, except there wasn't another town, town C. And in town C, these people didn't just have a mass media campaign. They also, everyone in the town agreed to attend workshops about the behavior that they wanted them to have more knowledge about. Workshops, active workshops. And in town C, they had a heck of a lot more knowledge than they did in town A or B. But sort of obvious, right? I mean, if I'm a smoker and I'm watching TV and a commercial comes on that tells me I shouldn't be watching TV, click. <laughs> I'm not going to watch that commercial. I remember when I used to get magazines and the first thing I would do as soon as I got the magazine was go over to the trash can and so all the little inserts would fall into the trash can because I didn't care about them. I didn't want them. So a mass media passive campaign, some people are going to get the information and some people are not going to get the information. Some of the information is going to come through. Some of the information is just going to be lost. But if you have an active participation in workshops, you can't just ignore it. It's going to get into your brain. You're going to know what, the, what they're trying to teach you. Do you get that? Yes, no? Yes. So this is actual data from an actual experiment done in California. Now the question is, here's the knowledge. Did it change their behavior? Did their behaviors change? Because we watched also not just a survey of how much do they know, but we also did surveys of what they're actually doing as well. And that, and that survey showed Yes, there is a definite correlation between how much a person knows and what they're doing. But look at the third year. <laughs> it's, look at the third year. Remember, they stopped the mass media campaigns and stopped the workshops in the second year, and they came back the third year to see what had happened. And in town C and town B, they actually started to do worse behaviors, so more bad behaviors. Bad behaviors were increasing in the population. But town A continued on the decline because they hadn't had the, they weren't forced basically to stop their behaviors. And so the national media campaign was still in effect and slowly changing their behavior. I would have loved it if they'd gone four and five years out to see where these lines converged. That would have been pretty interesting to see if they did, if they did converge. But we can't really say that the difference in the, and in the behaviors of B and C because they're not that different compared to the amount of knowledge they have, but is the difference between the, the behaviors in towns B and C because of their knowledge or because of the active participation as opposed to passive participation in getting that knowledge? And we don't know that answer. And that's problems with all research. There's always somebody like me coming along going, but what if, <laughs> what if? So there are 11 steps to personal wellness, exercising regularly, and remember not too much exercise, uh, sufficient for you. Eat nutritious meals, stay away from sugar. Maintain a sensible weight. Sleep eight hours a night. Now, remember when we talked about sleep, eight hours a night is the average but you might be a little bit different so get your amount of sleep that you need you that you know you need wear safety goggles when pursuing your activities do not smoke or take illegal drugs use alcohol in moderation if you use it at all engage in safe sex of course you don't want to have somebody you don't want to get pregnant or get somebody pregnant or transmit sexually transmitted diseases either uh, get regular dental and medical checkups. Now, mental check the the medical checkups are pretty obvious. Get regular dental and medical checkups. The, you, yeah, obviously our bodies have to be in good shape. Why 
what does dental have anything to do with this? And it turns out in the um, animal kingdom, the human mouth is one of the dirtiest, not the four letter words that come out of it, but the amount of bacteria and viruses that live in our mouths. But when we swallow, it goes down into our stomach and gets killed by the acid in our stomach. So not a big deal. But it is a big deal if your gums are bleeding because all that bacteria and all the viruses then have a direct access to your bloodstream. And you can get sepsis, which is a full body infection, sepsis. So you need to keep your teeth in good shape and your gums in good shape. Get redder, so get regular dental checkups. Learn to be as optimistic as possible. I can't make a pessimist into an optimist, but at least I can make them less pessimistic. And find the support system that you need, your BFFs. Have, a, have three really good BFFs in life. The last slide here is about subjective well-being. Your, your feelings about how well you're doing are more important than what I think you are. Uh, this level of happiness that you have is an individual's evaluative response to his or her life. How do you feel, including your cognitive and emotional reactions? A general satisfaction with their present situation in life is high well-being, relative presence of positive emotions, and a relative absence of negative emotions. But it is subjective, not objective. A person can be walking around smiling and having a good time, but inside they're dying. How do you define yourself? How do you define what you are? So if a person comes into therapy and they look really, they look horrible, they look like failing. How do you feel? I feel pretty good, actually. You don't look good, but hey, if you feel good, okay. But it is the subject's evaluation, not the clinician's evaluation. If we think a person looks fine, but they feel bad, we need to treat them how they feel about themselves. And in spite of common beliefs, as I've said before, happiness is does more money does not improve your subjective well-being if you are middle class or above. If you are below middle class, yes, more money will help you, especially in poverty. More money increases your subjective well-being. But after you get to the middle class, it does not do anything more for you. Your subjective well-being does not improve just because you won the lottery and you are already uh, pretty wealthy. And that's the end of the stress and well-being chapter. Are there any questions about stress and well-being before I continue on with the next unit? Any questions? No's, lots of no's. Okay then, let's talk about personality. Personality is defined as the psychological qualities that bring continuity to an individual's behavior in different situations and at different times. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> it means that if I know you and I see you at an amusement park or I see you at a pizza parlor or I see you at a movie theater, you are going to be generally the same person I always know. You're going to act the same way. You're going to behave the same way. Your personality is what keeps you consistent throughout different situations in your life. So the theories of personality, there's nothing that explains everything about personality. There are, some, there are lots that try, right? but theories of personality attempt to describe, explain, and predict how personality, personalities develop and why there are so many different kinds of personalities as well. So according to the psychodynamic, humanistic, and cognitive theorists, Behaviorists are absolutely not in this group because behaviorists don't want to talk about thinking. They be, but according to the psychodynamic, humanistic, and cognitive theories, personality is a developmental process shaped by our internal needs and cognitions, our thought processes, and by external pressures from the social environment. And genetics play about a 40% role in shaping our personality. We know that people are born shy or gregarious, shy or outgoing. Gregarious means outgoing. So if you are shy in life, you're going to have a completely different social environment than a person who is gregarious, who's outgoing. And that different 
environment that you have created for yourself because you want to stay away from people if you're shy, you want to get out in the world if you are gregarious. The, the environment you create then helps to shape your personality. So although shy and gregarious are a very small, tiny piece of your personality, it can shape your personality. So 40%, not much more than that, genetic. The psychodynamic theory calls attention to the power of the unconscious and influences of our early childhood, remember? We've already talked about Freud's psychoanalytic theory. Humanistic theories emphasize our present subjective reality, the things that are happening to us right now, and what we believe is important at this time in our lives and how we think about ourselves in relationship to other people. The cognitive theorists don't have a fully all-encompassing type of theory. They look at very tiny little pieces like shyness and gregariousness, and they evaluate these specific pieces of personality. A lot of people don't like the cognitive theories because they are piecemeal what they call them, piecemeal. But I think that they have the right idea at this time in our understanding of personality. Instead of trying to look at the whole thing, find the little pieces and describe the pieces, and eventually somebody's going to be able to put the pieces together into a bigger theory. And we talk about, this is one of my classes that I teach, is personality theories. So if you ever get up in the Psych 239, uh, if you get up there and start in, in more interested in the psychology classes, I teach the 239 class, the personality theories. So psychodynamic theorists that we're going to talk about, Freud, Carl Jung, and Karen Hornai. Karen Hornai is a very interesting one because at the time that she became a psychoanalyst and a doctor, a medical doctor, women were not getting degrees like that, and she was a very pushy person to get what she wanted to do. Uh, so we're going to talk about her. She has a kind of interesting aspect to personality as well. Remember that the psychoanalysts are talking about pathological personalities. So they're interested in the, the reasons why people have issues in their life, not just a general focus of personality. The unconscious is a big part of what Freud uh, wanted to talk about, psychoanal psychoanalysis. Uh, this is the psych psychic domain of which the individual, individual is not aware but which is the storehouse of repressed impulses, also your drives and conflicts that are unavailable to your consciousness. Freud believed that no behavior occurs through chance. Psychic determinism, this is called. Nothing occurs because of chance, and experiences in your infancy and childhood affect adult personality more than anything else. Of course, again, psychopath psychopathology, so people that have issues in adult life. There are three instinctive drives that push us in a specific direction. The two drives and one energy level is really what this is. Eros is the drive that drives people toward acts that are sexual and life-giving. Eros makes people want to experience sensual pleasures and helps them come up with creative ways to achieve their goals. But Eros is the drive, sort of like a car. You could drive yourself around in the car. The car drives you, run around. But without any gasoline or electrical charge, the car's not going anywhere. So libido is the power behind the eros. It's the energy behind both eros and thanatos. So eros is trying to get the pleasure out of life, and we say people have a really high libido. And what we mean by that is there's a lot of energy pushing that drive, to get pleasure out of life. Of course, hedonism is a person who is just all arrows and nothing else. Now, you can compare this to a dam that has water building up behind of it, an electro dam. So it produces uh, electricity, hydroelectric power dam. It has little holes in the bottom of the dam, uh, up above the mud level, obviously where the water comes in and is really high, and that water produces a great deal of pressure. Every drop of water has some weight to it. When you get all that water together, there is a tremendous amount of pressure on the area where those holes are, and it pushes the water out of those holes. And as the water goes through the holes, there are turbines, and it turns the turbines, and that's what creates the electricity in the hydroelectric dam. 
and you can think of libido as that giant a mass of water that's driving the eros and it also drives thanatos but freud really didn't care about thanatos at first there were other people that were starting to become more famous because of the idea of a death wish death thanatos and uh, aggressive nature of man and so he had this desire to be more famous than anybody else so he added it to his theory and it is the drive mechanism that drives people toward aggressive and destructive behaviors. That's what Thanatos is. The Freudian slip is an interesting aspect of his thought processes. When somebody says something they didn't really want to say, they were trying to hide it, but they, it comes out. And so you can imagine somebody in therapy, and it's like two minutes before the end of therapy, and the therapist says, well, is there anything else you want to talk about? And the person goes, well, there is a mother, I mean, another problem. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, two minutes is not enough to deal with your mom. <laughs> We're going to take this back up in the next session, right? We're going to talk about your mom because you made a Freudian slip. You said something you didn't really want to say, but it's there. It's on the tip of your tongue, and you got it out. Psychic determinism, I just talked about the fact that Everything is determined by what's happened to you in the past. Freud's assumption that all mental and behavioral reactions are caused by earlier life experiences. Nothing we do is accidental. All acts are determined by unconscious and conscious forces. We've already looked at the psychoanalytic stages, the oral, anal, um, phallic, latency, and genital stages, and we'll talk about them more when we come back next time on um, next Tuesday. So if you have any questions, please stay and talk to me. Otherwise, have a great weekend, and I will see you on Tuesday. Stay healthy. Bye. Okay.